Hello, everyone. We're just going to wait a minute or two for people to enter the webinar. But in the meantime, if you want to tell us in the chat where you're coming from, we'd love to hear. Looks like we have at least one person who's been to Takarazuka before here. <laughs> Two people, it seems. Wonderful. If you want to tell us which ones you've seen, that could be fun as well. Amanda, were you one of the people? Let's see who was the other one? Yeah, Zoe, Ek Zoe Ekman. I think we also have Jane Neff Rollins. I see in the chat it says that they went in 2011. And Amanda saw Casablanca. Oh, I saw that one too. Yeah, that was my first. And someone else saw the Scarlet Pimpernel. Wonderful. Our friend from Kumamoto is here again. Nice to see you. <laughs> well, welcome everyone to Jane Austen and Company. We're so delighted to see you here tonight and we're so delighted there's already a great chat going on. Um, if you've seen Takarazuka Theater, please let us know in the chat. We'd love to hear more um, about it and about your interests in it. My name is Anne Ferdig, and I am a doctoral candidate in English and Comparative Literature at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, as well as the co-director of Jane Austen and Company. We are delighted to have you all here again for another event in our series, Asia and the Regency. And we're also delighted to welcome Dr. Haruko Takakua to talk about Pride and Prejudice as Angel's Ladder, Jane Austen and Takarazuka Musical Theater. For those of you joining us for the first time tonight, Jane Austen and Company is a free public humanity series hosted by the Jane Austen Summer Program. Our mission is to bring free events and workshops on Jane Austen and her broader global context to audiences around the world. Tonight, I am also joined by my co-hosts, Dr. Kimio Ogawa and Dr. Inga Brody, as well as our technical director, Jared Powell. And I'm gonna hand things over real quick to Dr. Inga Brody, to talk a little bit more about what this program means. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's nice to see all of you. Um, I'm a professor in the same department as, as Anne and Jared at University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, and as well as I also teach in the Asian Studies and Global Studies uh, departments. And I, I'm, I co founded and co direct the Jane Austen. Uh, summer program, actually I directed alone now, um, and which is the umbrella organization for Jane Austen and Company. And we've had three series so far. Um, we had first Staying Home with Austen, um, which was exploring the domestic arts in the Regency, followed by our Race in the Regency series, um, which took international interdisciplinary approaches to the experience and representation of race in the Regency. Um, and now uh, Asia and the Regency, um, which has, has been a delight so far. So we are really excited to have uh, Haruko with us today. Haruko and I have known each other for a while. Um, and it's, I've, I've heard her speak on Takarazuka before, which will be, and I know it's a lot of fun. So Kimio. Okay, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Haruko Takakua um, today. Uh, I'm uh, Kimiya Ogawa, I teach at Sofia University in Japan. So uh, Haruko, uh, I've also known her for many, many years, is uh, Associate Professor of English at Ochanomizu University, Japan. Her main interests are in early 19th century domestic novels and national tales. 
She has published various articles on Jane Austen, Mariah Edgeworth, Sydney Owenson, and Susan Ferrier in English and Japanese. Uh, she's also interested in adaptation studies and in Persuasions Online, which was uh, published in 2015. She, she wrote about Pride and Prejudice as Angel's Ladder, on which today's talk is based. I'm very excited to be here to introduce Dr. Takakwa, uh, especially since she is going to talk about this adaptation. Uh, in fact, she kindly asked me to join her when she went to see this production many years ago. <laughs> um, before we hear from uh, Dr. Takakua, we need a few words of instruction from our technical director, Jared uh, Power. Jared? Yes, thank you, Kimio. So I'd like to take a moment to explain how tonight's event will work. This event will last about 90 minutes in total and throughout and after the presentation during the Q&A at the end, you're welcome to put questions for our speaker in the Q&A box. So let me share the screen really quickly, quickly, excuse me, a little presentation here. So questions for the speaker will go in the Q&A. You see, click that icon and they will go there. And then at the end, Inga, Kimio, and Anne will take turns asking them conversation with other attendees. So again, continuing in the chat, telling us, giving us any comments on the talk or asking questions of other attendees, those need to go in the chat. And be sure that the drop down menu is set to everyone. It might default to hosts and panelists. And you wanna be sure that everyone can see that. And speaking of the chat, we do tend to have a fairly robust chat at these events. And if, and if what we've had so far is any indication that will be the case tonight, and if the little chat notifications tend to distract you and you would like to hide those, there are some instructions here. So if you're on a Windows PC to hide the chat, you'll first click on the chat icon. It should pop out in a separate window. And then you will just click at the top of the bar there and hold and drag it off screen. If you're on Mac, it works similarly. There's just one extra step. You click the chat icon and then it comes out as a sidebar. So then you click the little drop down menu, change it to pop out, and then same thing as before, click at the top and drag it off screen. And then finally, if you're on mobile or tablet, fairly similar process, click the chat icon, and then there'll be a bell icon that you then click to mute there. And if you have any issues, technical issues that is, I'll be paying attention to the chat and trying to help you out individually there. So be sure to put a message if that happens to you and I'll try to help you get it resolved. And with that, I believe we are back to Anne. Thank you so much, Jared. Please note that tonight's program will be recorded. If you would like, please follow our Facebook page and we will notify you when it is available to view on our website. And without further ado, Dr. Takakua. Okay, thank you very much. Let me first, um, Make sure I can share the screen. Um, can you see my slide, everyone? Yes, looks good. Okay. Thank you. So um, thank you very much for your kind introduction. And it's my pleasure to be, he to be here and to talk, talk to you. Um, so let me begin. So first of all, I'll just give you the outline of what I'm going to talk today. Um, so as an introduction, I will first briefly mention Jane Austen and in particular Pride and Prejudice's popularity in present day Japan and the possible cause, causes for it. Then I will go back and outline the early Austen reception and the establishment of Takaraska Review Company and suggest how Austin's respectability coincided with Takaraska's foundational spirit. And then I will talk specifically about Takaraska's adaptation in 2012, how they adapted Pride and Prejudice into its own style into Angel's Ladder, which has a strong inclination towards a fantasized romance plot. And we will finally consider what the adaptation in turn tells about the original novel. Okay. 
So um, Pride and Prejudice is popular. And in Japan, we have more than 10 translations of it. And three new translations came out in the 2010s, the latest being the 2017 publication. And what was remarkable in recent years was that Jane Austen's novels were turned into manga comics. And Osura Publishing did this, and they published Pride and Prejudice, Sense and Sensibility, and Emma in 2009, 10, and 11, respectively. And also um, Bridget Jones's Diary, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, and Death Come to Pemberley, which are of course the um, Pride and Prejudice adaptations, were all translated into Japanese within a year or so of their release. And this suggests that Pride and Prejudice is a content that Japanese publishers can expect a substantial readership. Okay, and this early 21st century Austin enthusiasm owes much to the film and TV adaptations in the mid to late 1990s. As you all know, the success of An Lee film Sense and Sensibility and the BBC miniseries Pride and Prejudice in 1995 marked the th threshold of the global Austin boom, and Japan was, was a part of it. For the Japanese audience, the heritage film versions highlighted the love and romance aspect against the backdrop of genteel rural, rural England, and in a sense, they consumed Austin as pure romance, just like the chiclet heroine Bridget Jones, who herself is a chiclet counterpart for Elizabeth Bennet. Recent Austin reception in Japan, so is a part of the late 20th and early 21st century global popularization of Austin as a prototypical chiclet material promoted through the heritage film. And this can this is strongly indicated in the manga versions, which faithfully copy their respective films, even to the characters' hairstyles and costumes, as you can see in this um, right top um, image. And these series were categorized as romance comics comics series. Also, it is interesting that the front cover of the 2014 Japanese translation of Pride and Prejudice um, featured the images from the um, BBC adaptation and possibly from the Kira Knightley versions, Elizabeth Bennet. And this suggests the prevalence of the heritage film, um, heritage film Jane Austen in Japan. So this is the cover of the 2014 um, translation. So it is within such a context that Takarazuka staged um, Pride and Prejudice as their original musical. Takarazuka, which is famous for being an all-female company, specializes dramatizing female fantasies of love and romance with attractive male leading roles. For Takarazuka too, Pride and Prejudice provides an ideal genteel romance plot between the spirited Elizabeth and the handsome and rich Darcy, through which to appeal to their predominantly female audience. Okay. So now um, let's go back in time and let me sketch the early Austin reception. Maybe you have already heard, but Jane Austen was introduced to Japan relatively early in its history of modernization and westernization. As early as, early as in 1900 to 1903, Lafcadio Hearn, who is also known as Koizumi Yakumo in Japan, talked of her in his lecture series at the Department of English in Tokyo Imperial University, the present day University of Tokyo, and he introduced her as, the, as an author who requires a good literary training to understand at all below the surface. 
and his successor and one of the most important novelists in the Meiji period, Natsume Soseki, also highly appreciated her as the leading authority in the world of realism in his theory of literature, which was based on his lectures at the university, which um, lasted from 1903 to 1905. However, in spite of this, it took a while for Austin's works to reach Japanese readership. It was only in 1926 that the first Japanese translation of the novel was published by one of Soseki's disciples and students, um, Nogami Toyoichiro. Nogami, in his introduction, points out that Austin's works are art for grown-up people and says, as I have quoted here, because of this, even though her works in one sense have a quality that appeals to anyone, they have not been read much by people of this country. And this suggests that Austin was perceived as somewhat being sophisticated and esoteric, possibly due to the high praises given by Hearn and Soseki. And it was with Nogami Yaeko, Nogami Toyoichiro's wife and herself a novelist, that a more friendly and accessible version of Jane Austen appeared in Japanese culture. Um, in 1935 to 36, she published a freely translated version of Pride and Prejudice as Niji no Hana, which will translate as a rainbow flower in a women's magazine. And what is remarkable is that Yaiko's introduction is completely different from that of her husband's. And um, it is a little bit long, but I will um, read it out loud. From my early days, the original was one of my favorite books. We often forget that she, that is Elizabeth, is a character from a novel of the 19th century and the early 19th century at that. She would be most lively and attractive if she were walking along the pavement of our Ginza today. Ginza is the main street street in um, Tokyo. Therefore, I present this book to my readers with a pleasure as if I were introducing you a young lady whom I have known so well and always loved. So Yaiko clearly feels intimacy towards Elizabeth. And this is very different from her husband or Hearn, who had some doubts if Japanese uh, male students could like Jane Austen or not, and warned that they might find her strange. So we may well say that it took some 30 years for Austen to be popularized among the Japanese reading public. Now I will go to the history of Takarazuka Review Company. And Takarazuka Review Company was born in the modernizing or westernizing atmosphere of the Taisho period, which lasts from 1912 to 1926. And it was the period when Austin reception in Japan was progressing. The all-female company started in 1914 at 14 as an attraction to the newly built spa resort Takarazuka Shin Onsen in Kansai area. At the very beginning, Takarazuka, which was called Girls Opera Company then, performed operas or music dramas based on fairy tales, but it soon established its reputation in the late 1920s with the introduction of pre Parisian reviews. Around this time, the performers came to specialize either in male roles or female roles, and the company experienced the first surge of popularity for male role players. Takarazuka lived on through the war period into the post-war period, producing renowned male role stars. While audiences dwindled with the introduction of television in the 1960s, the staging of Versailles Unabara, which will translate as the Rose of Versailles in the mid-1970s, which is a musical based on a best-selling Japanese comic series set in the court of Marie Antoinette, regenerated the enthusiasm, and today's um, Takarazuka's popular, popularity um, very much owes to this uh, 
groundbreaking um, theatrical performance. And um, so if you're interested in further details of history, um, I think you can go to this website. And if you go to Takarazuka's um, homepage um, here, um, you can see all the images and um, here is the history part. So um, if you're interested, please go and visit, visit while I am talking. Okay, I'll go back to my slide. So um, as the head of the multifaceted Hankyu Toho Corporation, which comprises of railways, real estate, department stores, and entertainment, the founder, Ichizo Kobayashi, conceived the girls' opera as a part of his enterprise involving the newly rising middle class. He sought it to be a wholesome, simple, and affordable entertainment for these newly rising group of consumers, namely the middle class women and children. In order to achieve this, he emphasized the use of Western music, defining it as national music for modern Japanese citizens. Such eagerness to embrace the West is still felt in many of their shows and music and musical plays are set in Europe and America. A lot of them are. And its strong inclination towards adaptations of Western classics, such as Gone with the Wind, and um, importations of Broadway and European musicals, may also be a nod towards the Western culture, the modern Japan so aspired. So as such, Takarazuka shares the yearning for the Western world, which Japanese translation culture um, was a part of. And of course, Jane Austen was the part of that translation culture. We should also note that Takarazuka is heavily invested in the middle-class schoolgirl culture of Taisho period. Kobayashi adopted schoolgirl system Gold School System as the model for, for his theatrical company. The performers are expected to go to Takarazuka Music School for two years before going on to the stage. And the performers are officially called students and this, their stage performance was and is regarded as a recital of the student's daily pursuit. In the 1920s, middle class culture, sorry, in the 1920s, middle class culture defining Takarazuka performers as students and not actresses served as a very useful strategy in guaranteeing the company's respectability. So it seems to offer a wholesome, respectable stage by the daughters of good families for the daughters of the good families. The company motto, which is very famous, pure, upright, and beautiful, advocates such an ideal. Kobayashi further pronounced marriage first principle for his performers. And so the women were and still are only allowed to be on stage until they get married. He emphasizes that these young women are fit as prospective wives and mothers of the newly rising urban middle-class families. In other words, the Takarazuka students are guaranteed of their marriageability. In the meantime, their stage offers melodramas which celebrate the romantic love between a man and a woman. Being a single sex company, such romantic love stories are presented as an elaborate world of fantasy where the sordid realities of the sex are dispersed. Furthermore, marriageability or the implied virginity of the performers becomes the token of the respectability of the romantic love stories they offer. So in a sense, Takarazuka has worn its won its popularity as an entertainment, entertainment fit for respectable middle-class families, precisely because it endorses the bourgeois domestic ideology of heterosexual love and traditional gender roles. And interestingly, 
um, Takarazuka's cultural strategy somewhat coincides with the establishment of the respectable Jane Austen in late 19th century Britain. Um, as you all well know, uh, much of the popular image of Jane Austen was based on James Edward Austen Lee's uh, memoir of Jane Austen. And because it's long, I'm not going to re read it, but um, please take a look at um, what Jane, um, James Edward Austen Lee has written about um, his aunt. And here, what Austen Lee foregrounds about his aunt Jane is her ordinariness by compiling negatives such as she had her such as saying that she has no history, no eccentric um, or nothing eccentric or she has nothing eccentric or angular, or no ruggedness of temper, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this formed the Victorian image of the genteel Austen, who is modest, affectionate and unworldly. So in other words, she established Austin's cultural capital by emphasizing her respectability and succeeded in selling her country house novels as a commodifiable cultural romance, as Clara Toot calls them. So the late Victorian culture rendered Jane Austen in a particularly conservative and respectable light, and the canonized Jane Austen was formed as such. This is also pointed out by Deirdre Lynch, and she says that behind such emphasis on her being the quintessential good girl, Jane Austen has from time to time caused trouble for literary history because, her, because, of her spin, because her spinsterhood and childlessness render her gender problematic. Claudia Johnson also points out that what the mainstream Austen critics of the 1940s and 50s, such as D.W. Harding, F.R. Leavis, Marvin Mudrick, and Wayne C. Booth did, was to privilege her novel's marriage plot by playing down the latent queerness in her, and thus to accept her works as heterosexual and normal. Thus, in a way, Austen's cultural standing and that of Takarazuka seem unexpectedly similar. In both cases, their popularity is based on their respectability through their conformity to heteronormative discourse. In this sense, it is quite logical that Pride and Prejudice potentially offered Takarazuka most ideal material. Okay. So now let's move on to the case study of Takarazuka's adaptation of Austin's novel. And um, here, is a, here are some performance data, and um, I will show you the flyer, and you can go to the flyer by um, going to this website, um, which is this. And this was the flyer for The Angel's Ladder with Darcy in front and Elizabeth in the background. Okay. So, um, Angel's Ladder is made very takalaska right like while following Austin's plot faithfully. The scripter and director Suzuki K explains that he basically treated Darcy and Lizzie and Pride and Prejudice as raw materials for creating a typical Takarazuka stage. And thus Suzuki stages the piece in an orthodox Takarazuka style. And what I mean by this is that the performance begins with a prologue of a brief ballet sequence by the angels in white tutus. And if you imagine something like the cupids in Don Quixote, I think you can um, have some a good idea. And this gives a fairy tale like gloss over the stage. And the same angels celebrate the marriage of Darcy and Elizabeth at the end. The main story is quickly followed by the typical Takarazuka finale. Which, comprise, which comprises of a stylish dance by the mayoral cast and the so-called romantic 
duet dance by the lead and her partner. The title of the Takarazuka version itself suggests a rosy vision of love and, love and harlequin romance. Um, Angel's Ladder actually refers to the crepuscular rays, the rays of sunlight that stream through the gaps of clouds, which may invoke the beautiful land, English landscape paintings by Constable or Turner. It is also the title of a fairy tale which the Bennett girls cherish and is referred to on the stage repeatedly. This suggests what Takarazuka seeks from Pride and Prejudice is a fairy tale like pure romance of ideal love. Going to the next point, from such a standpoint, Takarazuka is not so much concerned about depicting the world of Pride and Prejudice with historical accuracy. So it is inevitable that the intricate social differences among the Darcy's, the Bingley's, and the Bennett's should be reduced to the binary of the rich, that is the Darcy's and the Bingley's, and the not so rich, the Bennett's. As present day Japanese society has no rigid class system, it is necessary to simplify the difference in rank into monetary terms to make it understandable. Also, Takarazuka is quite casual about dates and locations. The playbill uh, mistakenly, mistakenly announces that the story is set in the English countryside of the 17th and 18th century, which is in fact uh, 100 years older, while the performers wear the costumes that vary from short-bodied Regency gowns to crinoline Victorian skirts and from knee breeches to long trousers. The audience is not too sure where Longbourn, Netherfields, Rosings, and Pemberley are either. Suzuki states that the title Angel's Ladder was inspired from the landscape of the Lake District. And so in one of the musical numbers, the Bennets have to go over the hills and dales to attend the Meriton Ball, um, which is rather strange for the south of England. And um, in spite of all these discrepancies, the theatre critics did not seem to mind these inac inaccuracies at all. And this means that for Takarazuka, what matters in Pride and Prejudice is the genteel English atmosphere of some olden days in which the difference of social standing was a great barrier for the lovers to overcome. However, as an all-female company with a strong leaning towards romantic plots, the biggest characteristic of Takarazuka is its world, its world that centers on male characters. The stage is based on conventional heterosexual gender, gender model, and it is always the attractive male role player that plays the lead, while Musumeyaku, or female role player, can only play opposite the lead. Takarazuka also adopts a strictly hierarchical model in promoting their male role stars. At the top of the pyramid is a so-called top star who always plays the lead with her fixed female role partner. And immediate be immediately below her is a number two, who constantly plays the most important supporting male role. And below that, there are the number three, four, and sometimes five, um, even though it is, it is not official. And so the performers are ranked according to their potential as stars. So one of the requisites of Takarazuka performance is to provide each of these performers her highlights, highlight scenes according to her importance in the hierarchy, while designing the heterosexual love plot between the hero and heroine to prevail the whole performance. So how do they make this work? To make Pride and Prejudice work within Takarazuka's grammar, obviously Elizabeth Bennet's sto story has to be turned into that of Fitzwilliam Darcy. 
Suzuki presents Darcy as a hero who hides his passion beneath, beneath a stiff, proud facade. Darcy's romantic nature is revealed in musical numbers. For example, after getting to know Elizabeth better, he dreamily thinks of her as an angel, and, and she, he sings a song called You Are an Angel. And after the disastrous first proposal, he breaks into a heart-rending aria. To make the audience share Darcy's point of view, Wickham's attempted elopement with Georgiana Darcy is revealed quite early. In fact, it is um, introduced immediately after their re-encounter at Meryton. And this stress stresses that Darcy's interference in the Bingley Jane affair is triggered by his bitter experience rather than by his snobbery. And like in the 1995 BBC version of Pride and Prejudice, a fencing scene is created to show Darcy's stoic determination to heed Elizabeth's criticism, and the confrontation with Wickham at his London lodging is dramatized in detail. Further, it is Darcy and not Elizabeth Bennet who stands up to Lady Catherine de Bourgh, persuading her of his passionate love of Elizabeth and of the futility of the upper class pride and prejudice. Other male characters are also given due importance to meet the requirements of Takaraska's hierarchy. In this instance, the role of George Wickham is given to the number two male role player of the company, while Charles Bingley is played by the number three. The role of William Collins is allotted to a rising versatile male role player. Suzuki takes care that these male characters should not appear totally repugnant to the female audience so that the fans of the individual performers would not be put off. While the characterization of Bingley is thus straightforward, Mr. Collins's civility and pompousness is turned into a mere eccentricity. He becomes an overreacting clumsy fellow, a likable buffoon rather than outrageous snob. He is also rendered important in that he explains the plot to the audience. Wickham's modification is even more significant. While presenting him as in the novel, as a profligate womanizer, Suzuki dramatizes Wickham's bitter disappointment at his fortune and his rivalry towards the more fortunate companion of his youth, that is Darcy. Furthermore, when confronted by Darcy at the, inn, at the London Inn, he, um, somewhat surprisingly, I must confess, um, he says that he, he has genuine tender feelings towards Lydia, and uh, remarks that her artlessness and cheerfulness has softened his bitterness and that he wishes to turn a new leaf for her sake. Thus, the antagonist of the play is given an appealing part of the reformed rake, which in turn reflects upon the upright Darcy who generously forgives him and gives him a chance to start afresh. As male characters are thus foregrounded in Takarazuka musical, Elizabeth Bennet's importance is inversely diminished. Compared with the novel, her consciousness gets less attention, especially in Act Two, which starts right after Darcy's first proposal. As I have already mentioned, the important conversation with Lady Catherine, where Elizabeth asserts her equality as a gentleman's daughter, is altogether omitted. While Elizabeth's spiritedness is a great charm on the stage, the almost combat-like nature of her conversations with Darcy is somewhat curbed, and instead Suzuki emphasizes her girl-like innocence. Elizabeth of Angel's Ladder is an innocent idealist who believes in the fairy tale of Angel's Ladder that the lovers who meet, 
who meet beneath the beautiful crepuscular rays, the angel's ladder will be happily united. The useful idealism rather than her sharp wit and acute observation, becomes the most commendable feature for Elizabeth as a Takarazka heroine. With such modifications, Angel's Ladder has become a conventional love story of a passionate nobleman and a spirited, innocent young woman, and Takarazka fans and critics appreciated it as a typical Takarazka feel-good production with a traditional romance plot of misunderstanding and reconciliation. The fact that Darcy's noble mien suited the lead Suzumi Shio's refined acting style led to the favorable reception in Takarazka culture because um, in Takarazuka, the audience tends to put more weight on whether the script succeeds in drawing out the performer's personal appeal than on whether the script itself is well written. The fact that the supporting male role players had good scenes and that the female role players also had good parts as the Bennett sisters also contributed to positive ratings. However, what Angel's Ladder really highlights through, through its adaptation is the difficulty of reorganizing the story around Darcy. In spite of the various Takarazuka conventions that foreground Darcy, as I have explained, Suzuki does not necessarily succeed in doing so. For one thing, as one critic, Iwa Minatsuko, pointed out in her review, Suzuki seems to find Elizabeth's viewpoint too fascinating to discard, and as a consequence, as I have quoted here, the other side of the story, that is why Darcy gets attracted by Lizzie, was not described enough. The excitement caused by the news of the newcomers, the pride wounded by Darcy's ungracious remark at the assembly, the puzzlement at his inexplicable behavior, the readers of Pride and Prejudice more or less share the worldview Elizabeth has construed. Hence the drama of the disast disastrous first proposal and Darcy's letter that follows lies in the readers realizing how wrong Elizabeth can be with all her acuteness and observations. In this sense, Suzuki's version also relies on the Pride and Prejudice on Elizabeth's part to propel the drama. This reliance may partly be because Darcy is not an articulate character. In Pride and Prejudice, what the readers mainly see of him is limited to his restrained actions to reactions to Elizabeth, her family, and his friends and relatives. And most of his important actions, such as solving the Wickham and Lydia's elopement are only subsequently reported. As some of you have already felt, uh, like, like myself, one of the difficulties of spin-offs centering on Darcy is the fact that Darcy does not seem like Darcy when he, when, once he pours out his heart out. For example, in this musical, um, however acute Darcy's tumult after the failure of his first proposal may be, his, the dramatic musical expressions such, expressions such as, uh, as, he, as he sings along, I'm born under this star to meet you and I have no regret, makes Darcy sound romantically banal. To put it another way, Pride and Prejudice enhances Darcy's desirability by presenting him as a cipher Elizabeth has to decode. He is attractive because he keeps his mysterious silence. Darcy's passivity in this sense is so essential that Suzuki too seems to have had a, a hard time making him the center of the drama. Furthermore, the Takarazuka version emphasizes traditional familist value by concentrating on the Darcy-Elizabeth love plot 
developed at the expense of diminishing the satirical and ironic tone of the original. The realistic outlook towards marriage and women's lives in Pride and Prejudice is kept to Mrs. Bennett's desperate but comical attempt at matchmaking on the stage. Austin's criticism on the society in which marriage is the only respectable way for women to live is barely heard in Charlotte Lucas's speech, um, where she says, I don't have any dream nor prospects. I'm 27 already. I'm being a burden to my parents in Angel's letter. And her decision to marry Mr. Collins in some respects is not so bitter because he is only a well-meaning buffoon rather than a disagreeable snob. Moreover, Angel's letter ignores the wry fact that actually Charlotte contrives to keep her husband away as much as possible by encouraging him to work in his garden and by choosing a small back room for her parlor. In addition, the stage version offers a more favorable view of Mr. and Mrs. Bennett. Mr. Bennett is made more fatherly and actually he gently warns Elizabeth against the danger of being prejudiced. And surprisingly, Elizabeth somehow seems to inherit her romanticism from her mother because it is Mrs. Bennett who told her the fairy tale about the angel's ladder. As the translator Koyama Taiji points out, Many of Austin's novels de depict dysfunctional families, but the Takarazuko version, by contrast, celebrates familial love. And the slapstick scenes of the Bennets offer on, offered on stage becomes a token that they care for one another, another. In this way, the sharp and sometimes almost unkind observations of manners and characters in the original are curbed. And the world of Angel's Ladder inclines towards our happily ever after ending. Just as, Jane, just as Austin Lee denied any history of his aunt to preserve her gentility. Thus, the final, virgin, sorry, final vision of Angel's Ladder is that of a saccharine world of all's well, all's well that ends well, where we suddenly find Kitty already betrothed to Captain Denny, which comes as a surprise, and where even Lady Catherine de Bourgh repents her haughtiness. However, playing down Austin's astute observations and satirical tones does not necessarily enhance the ideal romance between Darcy and Elizabeth. Angel's Ladder, where everybody turns out to be good and all is well, may feel good, but it is too sweet and too good to be true. In other words, Pride and Prejudice's ending is rendered convincing precisely because it provides the reader with some dire realities of marriage and women's lives and of subtle class and monetary differences at the turn of the 18th into the 19th century. With the backdrops of re realities of women's lives, Readers willingly embrace the Cinderella ending where Elizabeth, with a fortune of barely a thousand pounds, wins Darcy with annual income of 10,000 pounds. Angel's letter in turn reminds us that the strength of pride and prejudice lies much in the characterization of a bourgeois individual heroine to use Franco Moratti's concept. So this world that he is Elizabeth Bennet and her worldview is very important for this story. So to conclude, Pride and Prejudice provides Takarazka with ideal material for creating its typical production. Austin's reputation for her genteel style of writing without any overtly sexual or sordid references matches the idealized image of love on the Takarazka stage. A costume play set in Europe is also a forte of Takarazka, whose exoticism derives from the westernizing ideology of the Taisho period in which Austin's re reception progressed. As a consequence, Takarazka's appetite for pure romance made Pride and Prejudice 
a sugary world of romantic love in which the Japanese female audience can invest. At the same time, such simplif simplification has made Angel's Ladder too fantastic and highlights the cool-headed realism and social critique of the original novel. The difficulty of presenting Darcy's story also reminds us how much the novel depends on the characterization of the heroine Elizabeth Bennet and on her viewpoint as a fortuneless daughter of the middling gentry. Angel's Ladder simply huffies and harlequinized harlequinizes Pride and Prejudice's romance at the expense of its more complex characterizations and social observations. Takarazuka's dreamlike Pride and Prejudice shows how the popular image of Austin's world is based on the long-standing reputation of middle-class respectability and heteronormativity of pure romance. That is all. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much for such a fascinating talk. I sort of wish I had the opportunity to have seen this now. because <laughs> It sounds like such a unique adaptation. And I admit I'm a little obsessed with the idea of redeeming uh, Wickham and Mr. Collins, uh, which is very unique. Uh, and I'm going to start off, if you don't mind, with a question of my own. As I understand, and please correct me if I'm wrong, the fan base for Takarazuka is largely female, correct? So this yes, is that is correct. Productions that obviously appeal to so many women. And yet, as you point out, they are also, this is an adaptation that centers the men in the production. And so I was wondering if you had any uh, thoughts or comments on what that appeal might be. What is it uh, that you think that the audience finds so charming in uh, the theater of Takanazuka? Uh, that's a very good question and very interesting one. Um, I think I think that uh, male role players um, sort of represent an idealized image of men. And it's a sort of fantasized version of ideal men. And I think um, a lot of audiences relish in that. Yeah, I, I guess if uh, Wickham is being redeemed in a sense, it kind of removes the potential danger, perhaps, mm -hmm. of a man like Wickham might re represent in the world. So if I could yeah. follow, if I could yeah, follow up on. on that, the same same question. Um, female female players, all female players, predominantly female audience. It is striking that the male center, the male point of view, is is um, so centered, but it sounds like from from what you just said that in a way it's a it's a female domesticating of men. Mm -hmm. Is that right? I mean, it, to into a into a tamer ideal. Um, yes, maybe we could say that too. Yes, interesting. Um, yes, uh, Kimio, do you want to ask? Okay. Um, so uh, I'm looking at the Q and A. Uh, so one of the audience is asking something about Noga Miyako's translation. Uh, so why is Noga Miyako's translation titled "A Rainbow Flower"? Who or what is the rainbow flower? Is there any meaning to that? Or? Um. I read it quite a while ago, so I don't remember perfectly, but I think there was one phrase using the rainbow flower in, in the text. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's derived from there. Um, I'm not quite sure why Nogami Yaiko um, used that, um, chose that for her title. Um, Kimiyo-san, do, do, do you remember anything about that? Um, all I remember is um, just like um, Takarazuka production, um, because uh, Noga Miyako 
lived in the same period as when Takarazuka was founded, um, they, they did actually share certain romantic tendencies, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and she was, um, she was drawn to these ideas that, I mean, you know, there is a kind of love relation, heterosexual love relationship between Darcy and Elizabeth, and there was a tendency for her to endorse that kind of love, even if she was very um, liberal and that, you know, she, she did mm -hmm. support women's independence, financial independence. I think there is an aspect to Noga Miyako's um, writing uh, that a man and a kind of idealized version of a man and woman should get together and marry. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so, so, you know, um, the, the reason why I picked this question uh, is because I think it's, in, in, I think personally, it's interesting to see a title like that mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, rather than just simply using Pride and Prejudice. Why would anybody want to kind of romanticize a title with a word like rainbow and flower. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. My, um, I mean, I can sort of see uh, to some extent Nogami Aiko's, um, you know, uh, not uh, heteronormativity, but kind of romanticizing yeah, of yeah. the story. So I, I just wanted to ask Haruko about mm. this. Yes, uh, maybe the fact that she was writing for the women's magazine also contributed to to um, choosing a title that is sort of eye catching and um, feels very romantic um, for the for her readership, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a good point. Yes. And so, I think she was quite conservative too. I mean, she, as opposed to the new women that was mm -hmm. emerging at the time, she was also writing, uh, contributing uh, a lot of translation for Seito, Blue yeah. Stocking. Yes. But she was the only person who did not choose free love. You know, she she actually, you know, she she re restricted herself to to this more mm. more uh, patriarchal structure of, of marriage she mm -hmm. she was willing to give herself up to this system and um, so there is a you know certain kind of inclination on her part to collaborate with the the patriarchal sort of culture at the time so there is this kind of wavering between patriarchy and resistance i suppose yeah. which is very much awesome like mm -hmm. sorry <laughs> so i'm finished <laughs> and uh, okay. Haruka, do you have anything to add on that or are you ready for the next question yeah i'm ready for the next question so it's been one of the most things that's been most hotly debated in our chat is um how you've described the origins of uh Takeda Zuka as coming out of a heteronormative foundation mm -hmm. Um, and, and yet there is a sort of inherently queer quality about all of the roles being played by women, especially these romances. Uh, is it truly, is that heteronormative foundation still kind of persisting today? Or are there new readings of Takarazuka within the public, within a queer lens? How do people in Japan receive those elements? Well, I think that the official um, take of Takarazuka and how they wanted to well, how they want to present themselves and what they what people widely accept is that um, they follow the heteronormative um, code and and that the Takarazuka is somewhat very respectable um, kind of institution. Of course, um, I think, if you delve into what the actual performers feel and what the what the real life of the actual performers are, there may be a very different aspect. But um, officially, it, it is, I think, accepted as very sort of conformative and very respectable um, even today. But um, of course, in, in, in the performances, there are some moments that 
they sort of play with that kind of idea and um, they sometimes show the possibility of um, um, homosexual love, between, especially between uh, male role players, all that kind of things. But um, it is safe because it is encoded in this respectable box and um, it's not seen as something that is outrageous. Thank you. Um, so another question from the audience, uh, does Takarazuka always change the presentation and characteristic of characters of plays they perform based on books? Um, or are, are there plays performed by them that, that stick more strictly to the content of, of uh, the original books? Um, yes, especially the um, musicals that were imported from Broadway or um, maybe even from um, European, maybe European ones are more tend to get a little bit of change, but I think a lot of Broadway productions are um, basically on the line of the original and such books such as Gone with the Wind, which has very, um, which is very much based on the um, famous, um, when was it released? I forgot, but the, the, the film with Vivian Lee and uh, Clark Gable. Um, that, that, for instance, is very much um, faithful to that film version, I, I guess. Although they, they will change things like um, giving more role um creating more characters sh shall we say to to fill up the roles but um basically the characterization is quite in line with the film version of gone with the wind interesting thank you but but it switches to uh rhett butler's perspective primarily then yes okay still okay mm. but sometimes um they have um what is called the scarlet version and Oh. And what is interesting about it is that um, it is actually the male role player who plays Scarlet. And so, oh, and really? so this is, an, again, this is quite interesting. What is interesting about Takarazuka is that those, um, the female characters who tend to be very self-assertive and sometimes seen as a bit rebellious is often um, designated to male role players. And the professional female role players tend to play uh, more um, traditional, sedate, modest um, type. So that's again, very interesting for me. Okay, so um, the, the next question for you from one of the audience is kind of uh, connected to what um, you were saying about the film. The 1994, uh, 1995 Pride and Prejudice movie centered around Darcy II, the mm -hmm. screenwriter was Andrew Davies. Could not both this new movie and the Japanese production that we're discussing are just reflections of our patriarchal societies? Uh, what, what do you think? Yes, I, I agree um, in many sense, especially on the version by, uh, yes, I, I also have, um, I also think that um, Andrew Davis's um, version sort of, um, in a way, harlequinized um, mm -hmm. Pride and Prejudice in, not to the extent of Takarazuka, but um, in many ways. So yes, I, I quite agree. Mm -hmm. What the others think, I, I, I'm interested. <laughs> I think that idea that it centers Mr. Darcy is a very interesting take on it. Mm. And maybe not one that I would have immediately come to, but now thinking about it, right? I, think, I about, think that it could have some merit, yeah. Inga? You think about the opening scene with um, the two men riding horseback and looking, stopping and looking at yes. uh, the buildings from a distance. It, it immediately puts it into a, a male perspective. I also love the way the the hunting horns, you hear mm -hmm. the hunting horns right in the beginning, which to me, it's like a, a, a twist on the 
it's a truth universally acknowledged line that the hunt is on, but it because we're seeing it from the men's perspective, it becomes a different kind of hunt. It almost sounds like it's a fox hunt. Um, <laughs> you know, that's, that's about to occur. Yes, and especially the ending of the um, the the very end of the Pride and Prejudice um, drama version also celebrates the family uh, much more than the original novel. So that's also interesting too. Yeah. But that fox hunting bit is quite interesting because there is already a, a research done by Barbara Seba, who has written a lot about kind of um, metaphor of hunt and Austin. And uh, she discusses uh, this hunting context within this kind of um, Darwinian, you know, <laughs> kind of competitive um, aggression of male characters. And what, what was interesting for me um, in today's talk was that um, Mr. Collins Wickham are kind of uh, domesticated, as it were, kind of, you know, tamed <laughs> in <laughs> that uh, version as opposed to kind of making them more aggressive. So in a way, um, somebody already mentioned this, but um, uh, what Barbara Siebel was trying to show, a kind of contrast between uh, aggressive male character versus sort of tamed, very docile uh, characters uh, who, who, who likes to stay in door. You know, th this kind of contrast may have been alleviated or maybe sort of, um, you know, softened uh, in Takarazuka's version. So that, that was kind of interesting too for me uh, to hear Haruko's talk. So we have a question about um, other aspects of the production. Are Takarazuka uh, plays, or specifically what you know of Angel Ladder, written by women, men, or both? Oh, um, it is written by a man. Um, Suzuki is a, a male producer come director. I, I, I don't, I shouldn't say producer, but a director come um, script writer for, for this production. So is that typical for Makarazuka or? Yes. Um, well, things are changing a bit, I think, um, in Takarazuka, and there are quite a few um, female directors come script writers now, but um, it used to be a very male dominant um, position. And so so that that is changing a little bit, but it's very interesting, isn't it? But uh, and these script writers and um, directors are called teacher, sensei, and um, so they they really poses themselves. Um, the performers poses themselves as um, students. So th there's this kind of very interesting power game going on, and. I don't know what is the actual kind of chemistry between or the power um, stru structure between the performer and the the director, but um, still it's interesting that they they kind of want to preserve this kind of very, very hierarchical orderly kind of system. If you wanted to, would it be possible for you to meet and interview um, some of the players? or former players? I doubt it, um, especially if you have some kind of critical eye on um, Takarazuka. Takarazuka is very protective of their performers, um, especially because of the SNS. And um, SNS. I think um, the social network mm. um, services. And in them, I think there are a lot of uh, personal comments going on. And I think Takarazuka is very sensitive about, about, about that. So um, that is why they are very strict of their copyrights as well. And they don't want to want us to reproduce um, their material on um, publication because it seems as if um, they are endorsing some of the criticisms that may come from a critic or, or other people. Hmm. 
and that's why and, and so they are also very very protective of performances any any performances or excerpts or uh, yes tidbits of the videos so that that's why several people have been asking about mm. you know can't we see just a little clip of it or you know don't they go touring to a, abroad but i think the answer to both of those questions is no right um sometimes they go abroad uh they but do. it's okay. yes I think they have been to New York um, right? in, oh. in, in the last few decades of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. So, okay. um, but there's and no, they do, there... do release some of the clips now as a promotion. So you can see a, a bit um, if you go to the homepage. Okay. And... and are there any bits of Angel's Ladder that we can see? No, unfortunately not. Their YouTube page is available, so at least here in the US, you can watch on their YouTube page and they have excerpts from many of their other musicals. So if you're interested, I said this in the chat, but if you guys oh, are yes. interested, you can go to their YouTube page and uh, see it and it's really worth it. I, I highly recommend it myself. Can, can I ask um, uh, the, sorry, can you go just a sec? Um, can I ask about the, uh, I wonder if it seems like there must be, culturally speaking, this there must be um, a built in comparison between this troupe being, you know, these apprentice troupe um, and the whole Michael Geisha culture, um, which is another form of female performer in, in, in Japanese culture. Do you? Do you sense that there is that they are defining themselves in any way in opposition or in in parallel to to the uh, to Michael and Geisha? Harukosa. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, um, I haven't really thought about that, but hmm. Yeah, but what, so I, I can't say much about Maiko and Geisha, but, um, and um, in some ways, I think Takarazuka wanted to distance themselves from Maiko and Geisha because they are, they are, um, how, how to say it, it's, it's very difficult, but um, um, especially in, in the, the earlier ages, um, the, this Michael and Geisha was um, considered to be someone who will be um, performing at the where where they are invited to the place with um, sake and and to the male male um, rich um, privileged male uh, people um, men so um, and what the early stage of Takarazuka did, I think, was to distance themselves from those um, people, th those people who who could be sometimes be um, thought to be sexually dubious, uh, and so I think they they want to distance in some ways. But because the Michael Card culture has changed in recent years and it has become some something that um, a young girl. Who, who aspires to train herself, maybe there is um, there is some change in that now. But but I, I don't know much about the Michael culture, so I can't say very much about it. Mm. Yeah, um, yeah, go ahead, Camille. Oh, sorry. Um, I don't know if any of you know a film called Sayonara. It's... Uh, oh. It's a story about a Takarazuka-like character. Um, she, she plays the main role in this film. Uh, Marlon Brando is playing the, the main character, uh, Ace. And um, it's, it's a fascinating story about Takarazuka theater. <laughs> so um, if any of you are interested to watch, I mean, it's not an accurate history, I don't think of Takarazuka production, but the, the geisha theme is in this film. So it's more of a Western perspective on 
um, sort of Western people sort of um, entering this new Asian country, you know, they're, they're kind of encountering these uh, exotic people and uh, one of whom uh, is this Takarazuka heroine <laughs> and, and she, she's a superstar. Um, and uh, another character, sub I don't know, another hero of this, this film um, has a relationship with a geisha type uh, a female character. So there is this kind of, I don't know, um, culture in which these two two forces coincide as, as in you know the more progressive women versus this geisha type of traditional Japanese women whom western people might project as more exotic Japanese so I guess during this period when Sayonara this film was uh, created uh, perhaps there was this kind of contrast role of females, you know, a more progressive type as represented as Takarazuka heroine and the other type as being geisha. So um, if you're interested, that, that might that be- That was a 1957. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it's rather out, outdated. I mean, if, if we look at that film now, but then again, it kind of, you know, is linked to some of the themes of Takarazuka production, you know, they, they were kind of struggling to find their identity as either uh, more um, sub subversive type of women or traditional type of women, you know, so they're trying to explore their characters um, within within uh, Takarazuka production. So I think I think Sayonara was trying to reach out to that sort of culture, you know, they probably saw Takarazuka uh, musical thinking oh we might be able to to use some of these motifs so, anyway sorry I since since Inga sort of brought out brought, brought up this issue about geisha I thought I thought of that film um a next question um I think this person wants to ask you uh if how how do you personally enjoyed it or if you enjoy Takarazuka in general. Uh, I think, you know, it's very hard to <laughs> talk about one's taste in this mm -hmm. kind of event, but uh, is there anything you want to say about Angel's Ladder? Um, in terms well. of <laughs> Angel's Ladder, because um, I'm a great fan of Pride and Prejudice, um, to be honest, um, the uh, adaptation didn't meet my expectations, uh, as um, you, you might have guessed from the way I talked. Um, there were some of the important, what I consider important elements in um, Pride and Prejudice that got dropped. Um, and um, and it was a little bit too sugary, sugary for me. But um, <laughs> I think um, it really depends on the 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 each um, performance and things. Um, I think some of you have written that she has seen, she or he has seen um, Casablanca, which is again um, adapted from the, the film. That was very well made. And uh, I thought that was um, very suited to Takarazuka style. And, um, and so what I figure, figure from that is that maybe for Takarazuka stage, um, it's very important to have a very strong, um, active, articulate um, male figure at the top. Otherwise, um, it, it will be very difficult to hold the story together. All right, I think we have time for one more question. And this one is looking towards the future. Uh, you mentioned some of the changes that might be occurring in the theater. What other changes do you see occurring in Takarazuka that might transform their traditions? Hmm. That's a very good question. Um, it's, to be honest, I, I'm not really watching Takarazuka very closely. So I, I, I don't know the minute um, in, in intricacies of that, but um, 
I think some of the things like um, I talked about the um, love between uh, male characters ha has come into Takaraska and that kind of um, things um, like LGBT movements that is happening in the world is certainly um, reflected, will be reflected on their, their stage. And as I have been talking a little bit before this session started with Inger, um, I think another thing that I, Takaraska in future may have to really deal with is this um, race issue um, because um, Takaraska often takes a lot of um, materials from the West, um, it becomes inevitable that they have to deal with this idea of race and colonial colonial past and things like that. And I, I'm wondering how, how, how they can do that um, at the moment, but it will be very interesting to see. I mean, uh, some, Amanda here mentions that they, in the in Casablanca, there were tap dancing Nazis uh -huh. sequence. <laughs> Um, so <laughs> it's like a lot, anything that's that's political and that is uh, is also going to be difficult unless you you know it depends on what you can apply humor and mm. sequence to I guess <laughs> yeah well thank you so so much for joining us tonight. And thank you to our audience for such a wonderful chat. We had some amazing insights from fans. Um, and, you know, it's just so wonderful to see such a collegial atmosphere among you all. Stay tuned because we have a few announcements to make before we leave for the evening. Um, coming up, we have a few more events to announce. So, Registration on our website is free. On March 3rd, we have a walk through an enchanted Regency Palace, Chinese export wear in the Royal Pavilion. Curator for the Royal Pavilion at Brighton, Alexandra Laska, will be walking us through the collections of the Prince Regent himself um, and many of the collections that originated in China. These collections were loaned to the Royal Pavilion from Her Majesty the Queen herself. And uh, this is going to be the only place outside of the UK that you're going to be able to see them. So that's March 3rd. And that's going to be, for those of you on the East Coast of the United States, new. So be sure to check your time zone um, and join us for a little lunchtime treat. And then on March 24th, we have Jane Austen in the British Way of Tea with Tea Expert. Dr. Markman Ellis, who is going to be talking about the tea trade and the importation of tea practices into England. And then on April 21st, we have the author of Sensei and Sensibility, Karen Te Yamashita, who has recently won um, the Honorary National Book Award. She is going to be giving a talk based on her book and answering your questions. And we are going to be sending around an excerpt that we've gotten special permission for uh, around soon so you all can be prepared. But we highly recommend that you check out her book. It is truly wonderful. Uh, we have, and you can see in the comments, somebody said they saw a presentation she gave to Jasna. So uh, be sure to come check that out on April 21st. Oh, and, and let me just say, it's not a typo. It is supposed to be sensei instead of sensei. It's a pun um, about being a third generation immigrant to Japan. I mean, to the US. Sorry, Anne, go ahead. Oh, all I have left to say is that you can register for free at janeaustinandco.org slash sign dash up. And yes, I had to look up that title um, when I was editing, updating this slide last week to make sure it was not a typo because it kept giving me the, you know, the, it kept getting angry at me for that typo, typo. Um, so, and if you want to read more about Jane Austen, her life, afterlives and adaptations, check out the Jane Austen Summer Program or follow us on social media. As Inga said earlier, JASP is the sort of parent organization for Jane Austen and Company, and it's a four-day summer symposium that typically takes place in June in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And this year's theme is Austen and Shakespeare, taking place June 16th through 19th, 2022. 
We have scholarships for JASP that are available to current middle school and high school teachers to attend the program in June. For it, the scholarship will cover full tuition fee and materials and a welcome luncheon. And so we encourage current teachers and teachers, teacher leaders, excuse me, in English, social studies, history, drama, theater, or other relevant disciplines to apply. The deadline for applications is 11.59 p.m. March 7th, and the winners will be announced by April 1st. And you can learn more about that at janeaustinsummer.org slash scholarships. And we actually have a new scholarship this year sponsored by um, one of our members who is a, uh, so it's a diversity scholarship for teachers. So if, if we're especially looking for teachers from underrepresented groups of various kinds. Um, this program today uh, was supported by the North Carolina Humanities Council, an affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. And we'd also like to thank UNC's Humanities for the Public Good and the uh, Mellon Foundation and the Carolina Asia, Asia Center. And I hope you will all consider making a, a gift to the Jane Austen Summer Program, maybe the, the, the price of a coffee at Starbucks. Um, <laughs> we are a registered nonprofit, so your donations are tax deductible in the US. Um, and they help us keep these events free and open to the public. And they allow us to bring in great people like like Haruko, so, um, and they help go to our supporting our other activities, our student essay contests, um, and our teacher scholarships. We are also, if you'd like to donate in a different way, we're we're selling our um, ampersand uh, pendants and cufflinks to raise money for uh, Jane Austen and Company. So, um, with the, these are available online. I think we've already given the link out, right, Anne? Okay. I just put it in the chat, so you can find it there as well. <laughs> but thank you so, so much, uh, Haruko, for today's presentation and to everyone, to everyone who could come um, and, and helped us have this conversation. Thank you. Take care, everyone, and hope you stay healthy and safe until we meet again. Thank you very much. <laughs>